I wish I could say that I always managed to have a Zen approach to my work, but it's not always <laughs> the case. But I always make sure that I don't, yeah, I don't burn out and I don't stress too much where I just get white hair every single day. Power to live more with Joe Dodds. Welcome to the Power to Live More podcast, all about productivity, organisation, well-being, energy and resilience. I'm Joe Dodds and I started this show to enable interesting people to share their stories about how they use their power to live more and by that I mean to do the stuff that they want to do more than the stuff that they need to or should do. It's about creating a life for yourself where you have the energy, health and space to be happy and fulfilled, spending your time as you'd like, whether that be at work, home or somewhere else entirely. That's your choice. Hello. My name is Ellie Dodds and I'm co-presenter and today Joe's interviewing Jan Ilunga of Podcast Growth Mastermind. Joe joined Jan's Facebook group to connect with other podcasters and to find new people to interview and Jan was kind enough to agree to be her first interview from there. Jan is a podcasting consultant, systems strategist and international speaker who helps business owners fill their pipeline with podcasting, automated systems and podcast guesting. Originally from Switzerland and dubbed one of the unicorn level digital marketing experts. He's the creator of four podcasts and the founder of what Forbes dubs podcast community to join in, the Podcast Growth Mastermind. Back to studio. Today I'm interviewing Jan Alunga of Podcast Growth Mastermind, which is where we met, although we can't quite remember how I ended up in uh, Jan's group, but uh, here we are and I, I've already told him I'm feeling a bit sort of, you know, Ooh, because he's a bit of a professional podcaster. <laughs> so welcome, Jan. Thanks for joining me. Ooh. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, Joe. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> uh, looking forward to I'm looking forward to particularly because of one of the uh, descriptions you used when you sent me your bio. So I'm going to see if you're going to use it, because if not, I'm going to ask you to talk about it in a moment. So um, start by telling us uh, a bit about who you are, what you do and where you do it. Yeah, absolutely. It'd be my pleasure too. So my name is Jan Ilunga. And as some people may have noticed, I have this funny macaroni accent. And that's because English isn't my mother tongue, but Italian is. I'm originally from the Italian speaking part of Switzerland. I have an academic background in communications. So communications is what I majored in both at bachelor and master's level or undergraduate and graduate level for our American friends. And I'm a podcasting consultant and system strategist. So what I do is I help my clients get more prospects into their pipeline through other podcast hosting systems and or podcast guesting. So that's what I do in a nutshell. Lovely. So you said that you've been dubbed one of the unicorn level digital marketing experts. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I would say, and you're not the first person to ask me this. I said in a, in another interview, I said, if a friend of mine hears about that, knows that it's not something I would write, because I don't think I've ever used the word unicorn. And yeah, <laughs> I was mentioned in on, on Inc.com. I shared my digital marketing predictions for 2019. And I was mentioned as one of the unicorn level digital marketing expert, which of course it's it's a very it was a very nice thing, a very nice thing to to read there. I was imagining it was because you're sort of you know lilac and pink with glitter and fairy dust everywhere, but uh, that's not yeah, what I meant, was it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and I have rainbow colors as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So tell us more about why you do what you do so uh it sounds like a a quite a a varied uh, day-to-day um sort of thing to be to be doing and uh really interested in finding out how you really got into it but also you know what your your purpose is if you like in in what you do yeah absolutely and maybe i can start with the with the second part of your question so how i kind of stumbled into this 
And years ago, I started my podcast. I'm a person, Joe, who could literally listen to music 24-7. And I remember back then, I was, I think I was studying for a university exam. And maybe for the first time in my life, I was like, eh, don't really feel like listening to music, but I still would like to have something in the background. Not too distracting, but not music. So I just did some random Google search and came across this thing called podcasts, listened to a few. I was like, oh, this is so cool. And I had planned to to do my own my own thing uh, when I relocated here to Helsinki, Finland. And I said to myself, well, I think I could do this. And I started my first podcast in the music space called the Jazz Spotlight. And as I was doing that, I was getting familiar more with the podcasting space, with the best practices, with the movers and shakers and all these kind of things. And then when I launched my second podcast, The 360 Entrepreneur, which... Uh, wrapped up after 230 episodes it was a business podcast i realized that more and more people started to ask me podcasting related questions uh, mm. i've interviewed grammy award-winning artists new york Times best-selling authors top entrepreneurs people would ask me how have you managed to get those people on your show what microphone do you use i want to start a podcast what would you say is the best format and at some point i realized I was focusing on digital marketing. I was doing some consulting there. I was developing websites. And then one day I said to myself, wait a second, every week I'm answering podcasting related questions, whether it's by email, after interviews, via LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever. I said, I have to take a second look at podcasting. And that's how I decided to really focus the or, or move the shift, the focus of my of my work or of the content I was creating and everything really, and put that more on podcasting. So that's how I became a podcasting consultant. Now, mm -hmm. in terms of why I do what I do is because I think that audio as a platform and podcasts as a medium can be a very effective asset for consultant, for business owners, for podcasters, for authors, almost for anybody really. But I feel that there are obstacles that kind of take people back or hold them back from achieving different things. I mentioned, for example, fill the pipeline. So I try to focus. There are many different things I could do. And sometimes with certain clients, I do work that I don't do with other clients. But the main focus for me is to try to help people leverage audio as a medium in combination mm -hmm. with automated systems to actually get more prospects to gravitate toward them so that then they can have conversations that ideally lead to a sale. Yeah. So so audio is, is well, rather podcasting is becoming... Well, they keep saying it's like the, the next big thing in the same way that they've said the video is the next big thing for about the last five years. Right. And then <laughs> Snapchat was and yeah. <laughs> um, but it's still, you know, when you talk to people, a lot of people say they don't listen to podcasts. I think there's people like um, you and I who probably listen to tons of them as well as making them and um, other people who don't listen at all. Um, and that's, I think, in the majority, when, as I say, when I speak to people, they're, they're usually, oh, how do you do that then? Where can I find that? I had it yesterday, yeah. in fact. I, I talked about uh, the, uh, the Engage with Success podcast that I do at, at a conference I was at yesterday and somebody said, you know, where can we find it? And I would have already looked on iTunes or Apple podcasts um, or via the uh, Overcast app that I use for my podcasts to see if I could find it during the conference without needing to ask that question. And yet people do ask that question, which says to me that they, you know, they're not particularly podcast listeners. So mm -hmm. is it growing as quickly as we're being told it is, do you think? Or is it only in certain sort of groups of people? Because we are in our own little bubbles, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's a great question. Well, I would say to your comment, Joe, it really depends on the on the target audience. And I can mm. see that very well because I've created different podcasts in different spaces. So for example, what you just uh, the shena a scenario you painted about you being at a conference and people asking you what's the podcast, where can I find it, and so forth. It's a question or are questions I need to address when it comes to promoting my music podcast, the Jazz Spotlight. So there, I really have to keep into consideration the let's call it educational aspect. So 
give people access to podcasting, how how can they practically do that? Whereas with another podcast of mine, the Podcast Lab, which is my main show, it's all about podcasting. That's something I don't even keep at the back of my mind because I know that 99% of the people who listen to that show are already familiar with what a podcast is and what are the basic steps to consume a podcast as a listener. Now, to address your question, Joe, I think it's a tough one because when we're getting data and you're in the UK, I'm in Finland, most of the data tends to be US centric, which obviously makes sense. But then I can say that I definitely am seeing more of a growth of, I'm not going to say only podcasts, but really uh, audio content as well. For example, here in Finland, it makes me smile when now I see uh, on TV, on the screen in the metro, on buses, commercials or TV ads for audiobook platforms and websites. And it makes me smile because I'm like, oh, finally, audio has arrived here as well. When something like Audible, for example, it's something that I've been using and I've promoted through my podcast for, I would say, at least two years. So there's definitely signs that audio is becoming more and more uh, an important sphere here yeah. in Europe. But I definitely believe that if we look at the data available, if we look at something like Apple Podcasts, we see a growth of the podcasting industry. Also for the fact that if I compare the new and noteworthy section of Apple Podcasts, when I launched the Jazz Spotlight, I think it was spring of 2014, out of 10 podcasts in that section, nine were hosted by an independent podcaster like you and I, Joe, and maybe yeah. one by a media corporation or um, a celebrity or something like that. Whereas now the numbers seems to be going the opposite direction. So if you look nowadays, most of the podcasts featured there are actually podcasts by professionals, whether it's a news outlet that starts a podcast, it's a celebrity, a, an athlete or something like that. So I think that those are signs that there is more and more interest in the podcasting industry, and that will probably lead to a more and more to a, how to say to a bigger growth for the space, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. It's um, I, I, it sort of to me adds into the whole productivity discussion as well, because one of the reasons I listen to podcasts and I actually don't really watch video is that I like to do that. The listening that is whilst I'm doing other things mostly mm -hmm. um I don't think that's typical but uh that's why I do that rather than rather than the video and in some ways thinking about the whole sort of overwhelm that we have with the media and digital and, and email and video and you know tv and streaming and films and all that sort of thing I sort of wonder actually if whilst I think the audio th uh, development is a great thing actually maybe it could work the opposite way <laughs> so we have too many people <laughs> multitasking <Yeah. laughs> That's true. <laughs> so let's talk a bit about how you organize yourself so what what you do uh to to deliver the podcasts and the services that you that you do for your clients um but also make sure that you're you know, doing things without being overwhelmed unless you are, in which case we can talk about that instead. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank yeah. God I'm not <laughs> overwhelmed often. I actually went through a burnout some years ago because I was studying at university, I was working and I reached a point where I was like, yeah, I really needed to literally unplug for a few weeks. So I've definitely learned my lesson. Mm -hmm. In terms of how I kind of prioritize what I do, how I organize my tasks, what I need to deliver and everything like that. I try to keep things simple and I try to break things down into two levels, macro and micro. So I look at what the yearly goals are, the quarterly goals are, the monthly goals, the weekly goals, and some days I have the daily goals. Personally, I have found, I've experimented with different ways of carrying out my work. And I found that the one that works best for me isn't to have planned. I know of people 
who have planned every single hour, hour of their day. So for example, they say, okay, from seven to eight, I have breakfast. From nine to 10, I listen to podcasts. From 10 to 1 p.m., I work. From 1 p.m. to 2 p.m., I have lunch. I've tried that for a couple of days. I was going nuts. So for me, <laughs> I found that uh, really organizing my my work on a, on a weekly basis makes it more... Yeah, more, I feel more effective. So for me, it's about the macro and the micro. So obviously achieving the micro goals take me one step closer to achieve the macro goals, the bigger goals. So that's kind of how I go about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, I think you mentioned earlier about uh, having those sort of monthly annual goals and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. What? How do you... Uh, divide those up amongst the fact that you've got uh you know four podcasts and you're providing services for customers and you've got your podcast growth mastermind facebook group you've got you know lots of different strands to what you do how do you set those goals and how do you then make sure that you're sort of giving the right sort of amount of time to each of the areas that you need to yeah i think that's the that's the key question really so thank you for asking me joe <laughs> well for me i found that it's really about leveraging my time effectively. So practical example, you mentioned the podcast growth mastermind, the Facebook group you and I are both part of and the group I, I manage. To manage the Facebook group and email, I have a very specific approach. I don't do that when I'm in front of the computer. Most times I do that, for example, if I need to, I don't live uh, downtown. So for me to go downtown, I need to take public transportation. So when I'm on a bus or in the metro or whatever, I have time to answer questions in the Facebook group or to look at my email. So I don't have my email open all the time. I have specific moments of my day. Typically, I do it after breakfast after lunch and then once in the evening where I go through my email. So if there is something urgent, I can answer it there. Otherwise I can answer it the, even the following day. And I use one app, I, I, I just love it. It's called Spark Mail. And the one feature I like about it is that it allows you to schedule the basically sending your emails. I know uh, Boomerang for Gmail allows you to do the same thing. And I like that because if, for example, I want to email you, Joe, and we are in two completely different time zones, and at the time I'm writing my email, it's nighttime for you, I know you're not going to read it. So what I can do is I can write it and schedule it to be sent at a time when I know you're awake. So that that's how I go with those kind of smaller tasks. Going back to the Facebook group, one thing I also do, it's once a month I spend about 30 to 45 minutes to schedule engaging posts. So that's, for example, welcoming new members and tagging them and use funny images, is scheduling posts where I ask questions, scheduling posts that foster engagement, that trigger the conversation and things like that. So for when it comes to my Facebook group, group for example, I know that once I've scheduled that, my job is to spend a few minutes here and there can be five minutes after breakfast and 10 minutes in the evening to answer questions, comments and things like that. So that it looks as if I'm always present. And the group at the time we're recording this is approaching 3000 members and I'm managing it by myself. And I feel that the engagement is there. So I've, I've found this strategy or this approach to the group to be effective. And then in terms of the other tasks, obviously it varies because sometimes I have uh, a client work that it's quite urgent. So that may kind of overwrite everything else in the to-do list. So I wish I could say that I always manage to have a Zen approach to my work, but it's not <laughs> always the case, but I always make sure that I don't, yeah, I don't burn out and I don't stress too much where I just get white hair every single day. And I'm only <laughs> 31. <laughs> 
So you started to uh, talk about tools. You talked about Spark and Boomerang, uh, both of which I use for different reasons. <laughs> um, what uh, what else are you using? Yeah, that's a great question. Some of my friends and mem people I'm in the mastermind with, monthly mastermind, they call me the tools guy because I always <laughs> like to experiment with new tools. And for example, I think project management tools, I've tried eight, nine different ones. But I think that's the key to find the one that really fits your style because maybe you like the features of one, but you don't like the design or you don't like the user interface or you feel features are lacking or things like that. So for me, yeah. the best way to find the things that really work for me is to test them out. So the tools I use, I mean, I could we could talk about tools the whole, the whole <laughs> day here, Joe, but I'm going to try to simplify. So what I use or the key tools for my business are Trello, which I use for project management and as a content calendar. Then I use Google Calendar. I don't think I have to add much about that. Then when it comes to my business operations, invoicing, keeping track of my clients' work, sending proposals, contracts, and all those kind of things, I use a different project management tool called Plutio. Ooh, and I've then, that one. oh, you haven't <laughs> heard of that? No, no. Okay, it, and it's like, and actually now that I think about it, I think the founder, I could, I could be completely wrong, but I, I want to say he's from the UK. And well, then we mentioned Spark Mail, and then mm -hmm. for all things social media, also there I've tried many different social media scheduling tools, and I'm in love with what I've been using now for I think a year almost, and it's called Social B. So I would say these are the key tools I use to manage my business. Trello, mm -hmm. Google Calendar, Plutio, Spark Mail, and Social B. So you sound quite discerning in terms of the tools, and uh, I think I've been quite this, quite similar in terms of project tools particularly. Uh, what, what sort of characteristics do you look for what what turns you off a tool and what and what uh keeps you with a tool hmm that's a good one joe well i would say because i'm on the go quite often one of the the must is uh, for me to be able to use the tool from my smartphone or a tablet mm -hmm. and for example i've used some project management tools which i thought were pretty cool but it didn't have an app and I was like, well, that's not ideal. I'm not saying that I would use Trello on my smartphone the whole day. I prefer a computer screen, but in case of an emergency or if I need to tweak something or add a quick note or something like that, I know I can do it with the Trello app. So I would mm -hmm. say that's definitely one uh, deal breaker for me because I've, I've used tools where I wasn't able to use them unless it was with the web browser version on a computer. So if I would try it with the smartphone or tablet, would say that nah, we can't, we don't support mobile devices. So I would say for me, that's probably one of the key things I look at. And then another one is integrations. So nowadays with tools like Zapier, it's relatively easy to make two different tools communicate with one another. But I feel that tools that have integrations within them, kind of their, their boundaries are great. So for example, Trello has the power apps and I love, there is one called Butler for Trello and I love it. And I think, as I said, Zapier is great, but I find that if I can do things inside the tool without needing to use a third party tool, it's great. So for me, the the mobile aspect and the integration slash automation aspects are the two things I look at that make me go for tool A over tool B. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good to know. So thinking about your podcast, do you use the same process for all four of them? And uh, does it change very much? Well, in fact, start, start with the first question. <laughs> you might say, no, I have four different processes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, the podcasts are different. So, the Three Six Entrepreneur, I don't, I don't host it anymore because it's finished after 230 episodes, and it was mostly interviews and some solo episodes. Mm -hmm. 
Then another podcast called Marketers was a collaboration with a community of Italian uh, entrepreneurs and marketers, and I don't collaborate with them anymore. But for the other two, the Jazz Spotlight, which is mainly interview based, and the Podcast Lab, the, the processes are completely different for the fact that the formats are different. So, for example, with the Jazz Spotlight, it's mainly about preparing for an interview. And it's something to this day, I think, with my podcasts and virtual summit combined, I've conducted, I think, over 400 interviews. So I, I'm, yeah, I'm able to prepare for an interview even with that, with just a few minutes. It's something mm. I had to do in the past, for example, at festivals where maybe an artist tells you, no, I don't do the interview and then changes his or her mind says, well, okay, can we do it in five minutes? <laughs> so there I have a certain process. And for the podcast lab, I have a completely different process because that's a podcast where I have some solo episodes and some episodes that also include audio contributions by some guests. So I mm. don't do interviews and it's a podcast where I use sound bites as well. So the way I approach my hosting of those two shows, it's it's quite different. And I would say the main reason why is because they have two different formats. Mm-hmm. So the, the second question I was uh, uh, lazily getting into before I let you answer <laughs> the first one. <laughs> Uh, do do you find that, that those processes change, and if so, often or not? Because one of the things I notice with my podcast, I've been running it now for I don't know two or three years, is I change it all the time because I find a quicker way of doing this or a different way of doing that, and I, I find it interesting just how fluid that is, even though it's a process. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think that if one looks at one's uh, processes and workflows strategically, then you are going to find things that you can tweak, that you can optimize. One thing I could share with everybody here, Joe, which I thought was a big thing for me, but well, actually, no, it wasn't a big thing. I really ignored it, but then it turned out to be a very big thing was I tried to centralize my efforts into one single tool. And here's what I mean. In the past, I would use Google Calendar, then I would have some notes on Google Docs, then I would have some notes for the interview uh, on Word, and then I would use Trello as a content calendar. And I realized I was jumping from tool to tool, whereas now I've connected my scheduling tool, Book Like a Boss, to my uh, Google Calendar and to my Trello. And Trello is the platform I use. So if I need to take notes, I take them in Trello. If I need to write down some questions or talking points for an interview, I write them in Trello. If I need to uh, add links or things like that, I write them in Trello so that I have now a central hub where I find everything. And I've I found that doing more and more tasks within Trello has helped me uh, or has improved the, the process also when it comes, for example, to the show notes page, because I have already everything I need there in the Trello card, and I can basically copy and paste it and tweak a few things uh, versus what I was doing in the past, which was, okay, I need to copy and paste something from Google Docs and then go and look at the right Word document and get something from there. And if maybe the bio of, of the guest was incomplete, I need to go to their website and find it and yada, yada, yada. So yeah, I would yeah. say that that has been the, probably the biggest change that has helped me make my podcasting workflow more efficient. And it's something that is true regardless of the format one has or the, the topic a podcast covers. Well, I wish I hadn't asked that now because you've just made me think that I should not be looking <laughs> at a Google form and my Evernote account whilst I'm interviewing you. And what I really should be doing is just using my Asana project <laughs> for you. Yeah, I mean, it is it is a bit weird. I'm not going to lie. It is a bit weird at the beginning. But mm-hmm. then I asked him and I was talking with a client a couple of weeks ago about this. And then he said, I, I do the same thing as you did. And why and why why am I doing that? I said exactly. I also asked myself, why am I using three or four different tools when actually I could do those things in one tool? Yes. 
yeah yeah exactly so there you go you see i'd made some changes to my process only last week and i was thinking oh that'll be it for a little while and now i've got another one <laughs> no wait wait i can take it back i i'm kidding it was like <laughs> we'll really bad advice <laughs> <laughs> uh, brilliant. So that's quite a nice link into talking about development and and you know improving yourself and and changing things. How how do you do that? I mean, things must have changed a lot within your business life, given what you do and and the way that, as we've just said, things like audio is becoming more popular and the formatting is perhaps perhaps different to how it would have been a few years ago and all that sort of thing. How do you keep up with you know what's current and and for yourself what you need to do for your next thing? Uh, you mean exclusively about business or business and kind of my life both. as well? So I'm thinking yeah, both. Nutrition. So I always talk about work-life integration, <laughs> the whole thing. Uh, great. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, about work, the things I do are I try to be an active listener and keep myself informed. So, for example, for those interested in podcasting, uh, there is Pod News, which is uh, basically an email newsletter with the latest updates about podcasting. There is a website called Podcast Business Journal, which is another very cool one. I've recently started uh, a column for them. And well, and then, for example, Facebook groups and things like that. And then I also listen to, to different podcasts. So also because of my work and for the fact that I work as a podcasting consultant. So I work with clients who have different podcasts in different spaces. I really try to approach podcast listening from different angles. So obviously I, li I listen to something I'm interested in, in terms of the topic, but I also listen to different things. For example, I've also listened to children's podcasts and I don't have kids. And there it isn't so much about the content, but is to look at the overall production of the podcast and see if there are elements that could be, uh, how to say, kind of extrapolated and used for my, in my own podcast or in podcasts that are in completely different spaces. So that's kind of what I do to keep myself up to date with what's happening in the podcasting space and also how to how i keep kind of working on my craft in a way and how i do that with podcast listening and then in terms of uh, things other than work i have a few a few things that i that i do or a few apps that i use one is actually well an app and a ring and it's a finish by a finnish company and it's called aura and the spelling is O U R A, so Aura Ring. The site is AuraRing.com, and it's basically a ring that tracks your heartbeat. It tracks your steps. It gives you. It it tracks through that. It tracks the the quality of your sleep, and it gives you data, which is great. And it also gives you advice. So, for example, it tells you, ah, today try to go to sleep between, I don't know, 11 and midnight. Oh, it looks like last night you didn't sleep so well. So try to take it easy today when doing physical activity. All these kind of things. It gives you a score. It gives you graphs and things like that. And I like the fact that it's a ring. So you wear it and you don't have to, oh, I need to remember to to turn it on or something like that. And you can easily sync it with your with the app on your smartphone to look at yeah. the data. So that's really cool. And then I use an app on my smartphone called Instant Fitness. And anybody who is interested in, in getting fit, I would highly recommend it. And especially for those who aren't gym rats, because I'm not really somebody who goes to the gym, but I still keep myself fit. And I like it because it's an app that features, I think, over 2,000 different exercises. So you can do different exercises, or it also provides you with different workouts. So you can say, oh, I want to work on, I don't know, my chest or my thighs or my abs, whatever. And it gives you some workouts. So those have been pretty, pretty cool. And then mm -hmm. the last thing I will add there that has been great, and I would highly recommend it, if there is somebody listening to you and I, Joe, who may have a little bit of a sleeping problem, and it's an app called Sleep Stream, and you can use it basically as a sort of, how to say, audio therapy. So you can have a natural sounds, you can have music, and you can basically listen to that to relax or even to fall asleep. And it also has a timer, which is really cool. So you can 
listen to, I don't know, sound of the rain or waterfalls or the wind and have the app turn itself off after 10 minutes, after 30 minutes or something like that. So Aura Ring, the app Instant Fitness and the app Sleepstream are things that have really helped me, yeah, feel happier mm. and feel better <laughs> for sure. I've I heard of that ring, uh, the Aura Ring through... Um... I think Dave Asprey of Bulletproof, I think they were on his podcast a, a good while ago. But I oh. do, if I remember rightly, I think they think that uh, Prince Harry wears one. <laughs> exactly. He, he does, actually. He does. I saw a post as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you're in good company there. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I don't want to, I may be completely wrong, but I think we actually have the same model also because it's the black and I have it. So I think it's probably the same. You're almost royalty. Not only are you a unicorn level digital digital marketing expert, you're almost royalty. <laughs> yeah, al almost, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, it's interesting listening to sort of apps and, and tools being sort of brought up on the, the podcast that I haven't heard of before, the, the, the latter two that you mentioned. I, I just, I've just been helping my mother-in-law sort her computer out today. There was a problem with her uh, virus checker and she couldn't get into her Gmail because basically it, it, somehow she'd been logged out of it and then didn't realize oh. that that was the case. So every time she clicked on the shortcut that I've created for her, obviously it didn't take her to her inbox. So therefore she mm. thought it was all broken. Uh, she is 75. Um, but uh, it sort of, sort of struck me talking to her and you've just reminded me of how there's so many things that you can do. I mean, she said to me, oh, I don't go on my computer anyway. My smartphone does everything now. And I thought, oh, that's really cool when you're 75. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's so many apps and tools and resources and things that you can use, technical term, things to, you know, do stuff, monitor stuff, learn stuff, help you with stuff. And so many people don't know about most of them because I guess there's so much out there. But um, it's just brilliant to hear about you know these new these resources in from whichever route whether that's through the podcast or through just sort of talking to people generally but I, I do sometimes think you know wow it's it's just brilliant that we've got all this stuff available oh and, and also given I had the um the the guy from BT round this morning looking at our internet that wasn't working and we were talking about you know 25 years ago <laughs> we used to have other phones with cables on and you know we were just sort of saying how much things have changed over the last however however many right. years. But it's almost like it's so exciting that there's so many opportunities. You know, I always think to myself, oh, you know, I need to do blah. And I always think, oh, there must be an app for that. And off I go off trying to investigate and find one because, you know, normally if you've got a problem, somebody else has had the same problem and developed some sort of technology to resolve it, haven't they? Yeah. So it's so exciting. But it's also, I sometimes think it's, it's quite sort of sad and frustrating that so many people don't know you know, like the lady asking me about the podcast yesterday and where do I find it? And you think there's so mm. much out there that so many people don't know about. Yeah, no, that's that's true. And I think it's, I mean, I would say one thing, it's really easy to end down a rabbit hole, trying to find apps <laughs> that help you do a certain things. And I've, I've been down a few rabbit holes myself. But I think, for example, with the Aura Ring, I've, I've only recently started using it for a couple of months. And... I'm not somebody who is obsessed with numbers or data, and I've always listened to my body. So I do sports. I play floor hockey. I play football or soccer, depending on which part of the world you're in. Sometimes I like to go swimming. And I've always been somebody who has done sport, I would say, most of my life. So I know my body quite well, and I know when it's good to have one or even a couple of days without any particular powerful or hard physical activity but with the aura i like that it really gives me actual information and it tells me how much i should unplug so is i well i can still do it maybe take it easy maybe just walk or maybe have a short swim or something or no okay today it's a day where i should really take it easy don't do anything but walking but otherwise taking it easy and i mean those are things that contribute for sure to a better quality of life so mm -hmm. i'm not saying that everybody should have the aura ring or you know any other app but i think it's also so that if you are having an issue whether it's an issue or problems with sleeping or it's about i don't know nutrition exercising 
uh, relaxing, dealing with stress, dealing with anger, whatever. There are tools nowadays that you can really leverage that can really help. And oftentimes those are other free or they are relatively wallet friendly, which is also a pretty cool thing. Yes. Yeah. So what about on those days where things don't go well, when you've had a, a bad day? Does, does your ring tell you what to do then? <laughs> I never have those kind of thi- <laughs> those kind of days. What are you talking about, Joe? No, yeah. Because absolutely. you're a unicorn. <laughs> yeah, true. Of course, yeah. I, I told you at the beginning, I have rainbow color hair, so I never have those kind of days. No, I mean, I think it's it's normal. So what I do it's 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 not rocket science and it's i take it easy so i do give myself days for being lazy sometimes it's okay to be lazy sometimes it's okay to just be a potato couch or you know just watch something or just read books or just go for a walk just go shopping listen to music for me i just take it easy Music, it's something that is very, very powerful for me. So I listen to music. And also one thing that I've realized is that oftentimes when I have days where things don't go right, what makes it worse is that I compare myself with other people. And I've realized that when you stop comparing your chapter two to somebody else's chapter 22, but you really focus on your journey, you immediately start to feel better. Why? Mm -hmm. The answer is simple. I use the word journey and a journey, it's long and it's filled with ups and downs. And oftentimes we forget that downs are part of the journey. So I had some, some, a day, I think it was last year where for no particular reason, I was really uh, without any motivation. There wasn't anything in particular that triggered that. And I was like that for most of the day. And then when I thought about this, I said, well, wait a second. It's actually okay to feel like this because this is part of the journey. As I, as that thought went through my mind, I immediately started to feel better. That awareness immediately started to make me feel better. So when things don't go, don't go according to plan, My advice is, first of all, take it easy, take a deep breath, do something that helps you unplug from a stressful situation. For me, oftentimes, that's listening to music. And then also remember that you are carving out your journey. So sure, look at others for inspiration, for advice, and all these kind of things, but stop comparing your chapter two to somebody else's chapter 22, and you're immediately going to start to feel better. Yeah, I think that's really good advice, as you say, that uh, we're all in different places, but we tend to only see the bit where we think is the same as us when it often isn't. (laughs) Absolutely, yeah. So what about on those days when you've uh, had the chance to live more? So that's where I talk about doing the things that you really want to do and not the things that you feel you should do or that you have to do. What what does Mm -hmm. that day look like for you? Uh, That's a very good question. I think it really depends because... I am a person, for example, when it comes to traveling, I love traveling, but then I also like the feeling of heading back home and do one's kind of routine things. So it depends. I would say that for me, live more on some days means doing something unique, something extraordinary. And for me, oftentimes that's something related to traveling. So it can be uh, exp- for example, one thing that I'm really big uh, a fan of are rooftop bars. So whenever I go to a destination I haven't been at, I always look at rooftop. First, I look at live music. So if somebody I know or like is playing, and then I look at, at rooftop bars. I'm not saying that I'm spending my entire vacations at rooftop bars, but I typically <laughs> know that I go at least for a drink somewhere. So I say to myself, I like sceneries i like landscapes i like to take pictures so why not to combine the two things so the the doing something extraordinary could be sipping a beer a glass of wine a cocktail a coca-cola a glass of water a cup of coffee whatever while enjoying a breathtaking view it can be doing something like whale watching i was in australia uh uh 
a year, well, in the fall of 2017. And for example, there I went whale watching, which uh, it's something I had done before, but I never saw the whales that close, up and close, really. And I managed even to take pictures with my smartphone. Very good pictures, very good videos. So those are things where I felt that, yeah, Live More really became part of who I was. But then there was also days where I really appreciate the simple things I have, the simple things, my, and what I, what I say things, I'm, I'm not referring to materialistic things so much, but it can be my, my health. It can be the roof over my head. It can be my friends, my family, my girlfriend. It can be anything for me. I, I found that live more. It's kind of a combination of those two things. So mm-hmm. on the one hand it's do a sort of, bucket list or once in a lifetime kind of a thing but then on the other thing it's also on the other hand it's also something that has to do more with gratitude of what is my let's say day-to-day life or ordinary life yeah yeah lovely thank you it's been great Mm -hmm. interviewing you Jan really really enjoyed speaking to you tell people how they can find out more about you and your podcast and your Facebook group and all that sort of thing yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jody. It's been it's been a fun interview. I had a great time here on the Power to Live More show with you. So thank you for having me. And in terms of where people can find me, my main website is yanilunga.com. I'm I know you're probably gonna have the links in the show notes. And I'm all over social media, but I would say the best way to actually connect with me, connect with you, Joe, as well, and with thousands of podcasters and podcasting enthusiasts from pretty much all over the world, is to join the Podcast Growth Mastermind, which is a free Facebook group where we talk about podcasting. And if you want to join, you're more than welcome, and you can join by heading to yanilunga.com for a slash community. So that's Y A N N. I-L-U-N-G-A. So yanilunga.com for a slash community and join the Podcast Growth Mastermind. That's brilliant. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Joe. All this information is available in the show notes. If you go to powertolivemore.com forward slash 102, then you can find those there. And the tool that I shared on the newsletter last week was Mavavi, which is a tool that you can use to create video. For most of the last year, I've been creating online courses for a client, and this tool has really helped. It allows you to create and edit videos. I don't actually use it to record the videos, uh, though you can. I use Snagit, which uh, I've shared on the podcast, I think, in the past. But it allows me to easily cut bits out when I go wrong. And when that happens, what I do is I just pause. So there's a bigger gap than usual in the video. So I know that I need to cut something. And then I start that bit again. Some people use um, clapping so that you get a big spike of noise so they can see where they need to do some editing. Uh, I haven't explored all the options on the app, but I have managed to reduce noise interference on the odd occasion that my video has a flaw. Um, and it does have a lot of options to give you flexibility. I'm just working on the principle of just in time as usual, i.e. I don't find out what it can do until I come across a problem in my process that needs fixing. <laughs> so I currently use it to chop bits out and I can add screen um, images in. So if I um, have an image and some writing and then I need the image to continue longer and record a bit more writing I can do that but that's all I've needed to do with it so far. I use it mostly on my laptop now but it does work really well on the iPad as well which I used mostly last summer when I was in the caravan so if you go to movavi.com m-o-v-a-v-i.com then you can find it there. You may remember that I was uh, doing a survey for home-based coaches and consultants to find out what people like and don't like about working from home and the sorts of support that people might be looking for. And I've had the results through for that and I've started to analyse and put together a report on that, which I'll be sharing in a subsequent podcast. So, So thank you if you participated in that survey. And again, the show notes for this week's show are at powertolivemore.com forward slash 102. And we look forward to speaking to you next week. Use your power to live more.